Here now is Solutionaries. I'm Lewis Bolden, and this is Solutionaries. So when a loved one gets the flu, you expect them to see a doctor for treatment, right? But if a loved one is struggling with a mental disorder, addiction, or symptoms of a sexually transmitted disease, why can seeking help be viewed in a negative way? That's because of stigma. Stigma is a set of negative and often unfair beliefs that a society or group of people have about something. You know, stigmas surrounding mental health, domestic violence, and medical conditions can cause someone to delay treatment, and the consequences can be deadly. So how do we end the discrimination and shame? Let's start with an issue that affects people of all genders, abuse. Verbal, physical stuff thrown at me, my own possessions broke. I was cut by a night with a knife. She tried to run me over with a car. How much more do you take? How much more can you take? Domestic violence, huge issue, right? But did you know men are often victims too? Yeah, that's right. But they shouldn't feel shame and they should know that there are people out there for them, a support system. Lots of solutions coming up, but this topic, this idea really hit me when this guy opened up to me. Violence became a pretty regular thing. It's one of those situations where you try to talk, talk it out, and you can't talk it out. So you try to leave to minimize the damage or the situation, you can't do that either. There was a point in time when I, we was arguing and I left just to be, you know, try to do the right thing. And I got a text message um, with pictures of my items with a message at the bottom of it saying, if you don't come home, I'm finna start breaking the rest of your stuff. This story got me thinking, who is fixing this? How are they fixing this? I'm gonna tell you about that in a minute, but first, let's talk about the stigma men face. There's no way in the world you're gonna call the police to your house, the woman walks out in handcuffs. Men, we get alienated when it comes to the woman being abusive. Being on the man's side of this, I won't even say kind of, it is embarrassing to just be singing a song about what's going on in your household, especially between a relationship between you and a woman, considering you know, the expectations of, of a man and the demeanor he's supposed to have. It's very important that we talk about and, and, and help the client to uh, address some of the things that you just heard, the shame, uh, the embarrassment, the gaslighting, and all of the other things that they have come to believe was true about why the relationship was the way it was. Statistics shows that about one in every seven men are are being abused, but we know it's way more than that. We started saying men individually at first. We said, okay, we gotta create a men's support group. And so we did, and it just uh, was very, very obvious that it was needed. They were able to come in and actually talk to other guys that knew exactly what they were going through. And the Bridge Over Troubled Waters has existed for over 45 years. Um, we're here in the Pasadena area, but we serve all of Harris County and even those outside of the Houston area who are coming to seek refuge from violence of any sort. Violence against men is not really talked about, especially when you're talking about it in an intimate setting. And so to receive services with the bridge, it's no different than a woman calling for services. We realized that there was a need for men needing to have shelter. A lot of the shelters that focus on men here here in the Houston area are homeless only. And while domestic violence is one of the main reasons that people experience homelessness, um, there needs to be places for men who are homeless but can also focus on that healing aspect of the trauma that they've been through with family violence. The men who have come here over the last few years and have ex experienced our support, we have had to navigate things a little bit differently. Um, it's really hard sometimes to get their stories out of them originally because there is that shame associated with it. It's embarrassment. Um, there's that idea that they're not going to be, be believed by law enforcement, by their families, especially if they're a bigger man, they're gonna, people are gonna ask questions and make assumptions and say, how is she, he, she or he hitting you? Like, how are you dealing with that? You're supposed to be a man. Um, but what we really try to navigate with them is that violence can happen to anyone, all genders, all races. Um, it doesn't matter what you look like or how large or small you are. Once we kind of help them, welcome them in our doors and help them see that it's not their fault, that they're not to be blamed, they're usually more receptive to the services and again, we just kind of take them through our program like anyone else. The shelter is a great solution for men who need it. This is not a perfect fix for the issue. A better one would be to prevent the abuse from happening. Education and prevention. So we have an, uh, 
There's a part of our program that we have our advocates in our outreach department going out into the schools, the communities, talking about domestic violence and really trying to change that language. If you or someone you love needs help, you can start by calling the National Domestic Violence Hotline at 1-800-799-7233. Another big stigma we're taking on today is STDs. They can leave a lot of people feeling ashamed. That's why solutionaries are working to make conversations more comfortable while slowing the spread. I have a passion for health and I have a passion for people. I want to be a, um, an avenue to provide information. As a public health person, um, this mission is exactly where I am and who I am. It's not just a job for these health experts, but a purpose, treating, preventing, and educating people about sexually transmitted diseases. New preliminary numbers from the CDC show an alarming spike around the country. As someone who's so passionate, this is near and dear to your heart. What is your reaction when you hear that? It's frustration because we can prevent and we can treat and we can manage. And treatment is prevention because if you're not treated, then you're continuing to spread it and giving it to somebody else. There's still a lot of stigma. There's a lot of fear about coming for testing. People don't like to come in and tell you about what's going on in their, their personal lives. Most people know that safe is a safe place to come and that you can come here and talk honestly and get good, good information and support. You know, we started as a hospice. Basically in 1986, people were dying of AIDS. They didn't survive. So it was a place to provide safe, comforting care to people that had HIV and often didn't have families to support them. As medication changed, evolution of HIV changed, uh, people are living with HIV rather than dying of AIDS, we transitioned our care to become more outpatient focused. We don't have a nursing home anymore. Instead, we provide wraparound services. Every opportunity that we can to talk about it and normalize it makes a difference. So we're doing focus groups with parents, with uh, care providers, to really just normalize the conversation so people know that they should come to us. We're trying to reach out into different community groups, um, but it's, it's hard because people are still afraid to talk about it. And the conversation is not just happening in metropolitan areas. Community Action Inc. of Central Texas has a similar mission, but with a focus on outreach in rural areas. Outreach is to, uh, to be able to reach those communities that really need our services, especially the rural areas that don't have access to internet or um, they don't have access to transportation. We've been around for a very long time and we have built the trust with the rural community. We go to the university quite frequently. We go to um, health fairs, local health fairs, any place that will invite us, we go. We send people, we give out information. We try to do as much outreach as we possibly can with the limited staff that we have. Despite the challenges, Belver says their mission and conversation will continue. Sometimes we have to fight a little harder to get some of the, the uh, support that we need, but uh, we're, we are there and our clients need us each and every day. I don't think anybody has all the answers, but you know, together we can look and try to find those answers together and work out the best thing for everyone involved. According to the CDC, Florida currently ranks second in the nation for the highest rate of new HIV cases. Brian Didlake spoke to experts and advocates who say Orange County is one of the top five areas in the nation for new cases. Those, those numbers are teaching us to, that we probably really need to do a better job in, term, in terms of outreach. Federico Inestro with the Orlando Immunology Center says they are working to get results. Doctors saying medicine has come a long way to the point where a person living with HIV can become undetectable. And once undetectable, they can no longer transmit the virus. The center now making new strides in research in a clinical trial for a therapeutic vaccine that may create a functional cure. Not for the person who's negative, they are for the person who is positive uh, and is also a vaccine that is kind of teaching the immune system how to defend itself against HIV. I think that would help 
completely eliminate the stigma that was created in the 80s of you're dirty, you're going to die, even though that's no longer the case. Marshall Turner with the LGBTQ Center of Orlando tells me he is hopeful of the results, but says even if a functional cure is created, safe sex practices are still important. Still ahead on solutionaries, bullies. I myself was afraid to ask for help, and it's a scary thing. It's not easy. Drugs. We've lost more people to opioid overdoses more recently than heart attacks. And PTSD. It's most important for me just that the message gets out there and that people understand that they're not alone and that they get the help they need and that they don't go down the rabbit hole like I did. Stories from survivors who became advocates. That's next. Welcome back to Solutionaries, a show that looks at big issues and spotlights people who are working to solve problems. I'm Lewis Bolden. Today's issue is stigmas. We've come a long way in treating mental disorders like schizophrenia, but despite these advances, stigma continues to be a reality. Like in movies, where mental illness is often depicted with violent or dangerous people. You know, for parents of kids suffering from hallucinations, Finding the right kind of care can be extremely difficult. Eric Von Aken found a health care system offering a solution. Then we have a waiting room here. It's usually for our adolescents. This is the first place and the only place in Volusia and Flagler counties. Sometimes the family sits here. Where children as young as 15 can come and get complete, coordinated, all-encompassing care the first time they have an episode of psychosis. Be hearing voices, you know, uh, delusional thoughts. Jason Thompson, the director, calls this navigate. A patient gets their, their meds, goes off, and there's nothing else, as opposed to navigate, which is a lot longer, more intensive, and they get coordinated care. These buildings here at SMA Healthcare in Daytona Beach each house the different components of care. Family counseling, this is Christine. Individual counselors. We have our case manager here. Employment or education counselors if the client wants to work or go back to school. And even an on-site pharmacy if medication is prescribed. Some parents have gone all over the county to find services specifically like this. A lot of times, you know, it's the parents, you know, that, that acknowledge it and say there's a problem and, and try to seek resources, help their child, you know, not commit suicide probably or do harm to themselves or others because that's what the reality is. You know, if this is untreated, you know, these psychotic breaks, you know, could lead to those things. To suicide. Yeah. Thompson says 21 of the 30 spots he has are already filled and Navigate only opened eight months ago. The extreme problem with kids, with, with you know, high schoolers, uh, with even middle school, you have uh, colleges and universities, especially after the pandemic and even, even after these storms, people are having psychotic breaks. Schools, clinics, and hospitals are referring clients, but anyone can just walk in. Navigate is entirely voluntary. Clients must decide if they want to be here, and if they do, they must show up at least once a week for at least a year. So how does Navigate measure success? Well, the first person to have enrolled in this program now almost a year ago, we're told, is about to graduate and is doing great. And the 21 folks who right now are enrolled in this program and who have committed to coming here and getting better and getting help, none of them have dropped out. And they say that is a good start. For many kids, social issues like bullying also come with a stigma. Speaking up and asking for help can be scary, something 24-year-old Michaela Nichols knows very well. Now she's dedicating her life to inspiring others who are struggling. I found myself in a very dark place where I didn't want to be on this earth anymore, and I had one of two choices. And ultimately, I chose to use my story to help other people. One life lost to suicide is far too many. I've worked with a lot of parents who have unfortunately lost their child to suicide at such an early age, and it breaks my heart. And I think that their story is so important because every life is important. 24-year-old Michaela Nichols is the founder of the Blatantly Honest Foundation. You know, the foundation's purpose is really to remind people that they're not alone and provide those resources to, to really let people know that their story matters and just speak up and just acknowledge, you know, the things that you've been through. Those resources include coloring books for elementary age students and her best-selling 2016 book, Blatantly Honest, Normal Teen, Abnormal Life. In it, Nichols talks about enduring years of bullying and mental health struggles. 
And you know, those feelings don't go away. I mean, sometimes it's, it's still in me, but I choose, you know, the sun will come out tomorrow. I choose to, to think of my semicolon. That's a constant reminder for myself because I still struggle with mental health. I mean, I think we all do. Nichols visits schools, sharing her struggles with students, letting them know it's okay to ask for help. I myself was afraid to ask for help, and it's a scary thing. It's not easy. You know, I can sit here and be like, hey, like, own yourself, love yourself. But that's, that's not always easy. It's really find someone that you trust and then talk to them. And, you know, if you're too scared to ask for help, maybe they can get you the help that you need. Let's talk now about addiction. With the nationwide overdose crisis near record levels, the government is announcing a solution many think will reduce the stigma around addiction. The FDA says it's addressing a dire public health need by making Narcan available over the counter. It's been long overdue. Substance abuse expert Tanya Sorrell says the move will save lives. We've lost more people to opioid overdoses more recently than heart attacks. So having every home with access to Narcan is a method that everyone can have access to this life-saving medication. 66% of overdose deaths in 2021 were from synthetic opioids like fentanyl, according to the latest data available from the CDC. Narcan blocks the effects of opioids on the brain by preventing them from attaching to nerve receptors. Over 90% effective, it should restore breathing within two to three minutes. Health officials say if an overdose is suspected, first call 911 then administer one dose of naloxone. It literally just goes in the nose and you just squirt it. Residents in Arlington, Virginia, recently learned how to use it. Let's say that you've given them a dose and you, you don't see any response. You can, after two minutes, you can give them another dose. Naloxone is not harmful if used on someone who is not overdosing. Getting this drug in the hands of first responders can make all the difference. Just take a look at this video. It's body camera video from UCF police. It shows officers deploying Narcan to a young man overdosing on campus. UCF PD has been carrying Narcan since 2015. And just last year, the school started offering the drug for free. And now to a serious issue impacting the lives of millions of men and women in uniform. Investigator Mike Holfield spoke to a veteran about her push to break the stigma of PTSD. For 17 years, I was strong as can be, and then all of a sudden, I wasn't. She's a hero on the mend, a retired Orange County Sheriff's deputy diagnosed and living with PTSD. For some reason, that particular one was the one that just sent me home and it just broke me. For retired Navy vet and Sheriff's Deputy D.A. Michaels, the breaking point was the drowning of a two-year-old boy in 2017. The trigger that fractured her world and nearly brought her to the abyss. I became dangerously close to becoming a 22 statistic. A 22 statistic. That refers to a study by the Department of Veterans Affairs that found 22 veterans lose their battle to post-traumatic stress on American soil every day. Michaels tells me first responders face that same personal challenge. It is a huge problem in our community and it needs to be talked about a lot more. Case in point, Hoop Adams, a Navy veteran now living in the panhandle. The stigma that is attached to PTSD is what's worse. Adams served his country between 1980 and 2000. To this day, he's still haunted by a shipmate's death, his PTSD. Adams told me his family, his dog, and love of life help him avoid what he calls the dark. PTSD, it comes in and shuts all the light out of your life. That darkness is what inspired D.A. Michaels to self-publish Courageously Broken, a very candid diary of her struggles with PTSD, and a reminder that you don't have to give up. Don't hide. Don't be ashamed. I'm begging you, please, because at the end of the road that you're going down, it's not good, it's death. A white paper study by the Ruderman Family Foundation found law enforcement officers and firefighters are more likely to die by suicide than in the line of duty. Michaels hopes the more we talk about it, the more lives can be saved. It's most important for me just that the message gets out there and that people understand that they're not alone and that they get the help they need and that they don't go down the rabbit hole 
like I did. I'm Lewis Boulder for Solutionaries. Thank you so much for watching. You can find a link to DeMichael's Heroes United to Heal website and all of the stories you saw on this episode in one place. Just start by downloading our new 6 app for your smartphone. And if you want to watch on the big screen, get the new 6 Plus app for your smart TV. Scroll down to Solutionaries and start watching.